That doesn't mean the message will be short, Jimmy. <laughs> and everybody else said, oh, oh goodness. We're going to start here in Acts chapter 6 um, and then turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So, And we'll spend the majority of our time there. But uh, this afternoon is going to be more of a teaching uh, time than it is a preaching time. Uh, preaching is, is excellent. And the word the Bible tells me I'm to preach the word, be in, in season, not a season. Uh, regardless of the reproof you could get from the world, I am to preach the word. Uh, but the Bible, or First Timothy tells me that the pastor is also supposed to be apt to teach. And uh, so I need to be able to, to teach as well. And there are some things that it's good for us to teach. I love, I love a good message preached at me where I get skinned alive and I feel, feel like thanking the guy afterwards when it happens. Um, but sometimes, I used to, there's a brother, a, a, pre, a preacher, brought, bleh, Brother Robbie Morrison and down in Ohio, and that's how he was. He could pre- still is. Uh, he could preach the message, and it would t- literally feel like you was tearing the, the skin right off your hide. And, uh, and then, but you were grateful for it, and uh, you enjoyed every second of it. Um, I don't really want myself skinned, but, uh, but I appreciate the preaching. And so, uh, but, but there's also a benefit to teaching. Uh, and, and that's what we're going to look at here today, and there's a reason behind it all. There's a, there's a method to my madness. Um, God has blessed us um, as a church with the men of our church. Amen. Uh, God has blessed us with the, the officers that we have had, the deacons that we have had in our church. And I thank, I thank God for the faithfulness that, that we've had, seen in Brother Troy and Brother Rich over the years. Uh, speaking of, now he's got to walk in front of y'all. <laughs> he's, right in the back. He's, he's, hiding a, he's wearing a mask for a reason. It's to hide his face. Uh, but I, I am so thankful for the men that, that we have had. Uh, as, as deacons, uh, and just the, the faithfulness, their their desire to serve, and not just me, but the, they they served for many years under Pastor Williams. Um, I believe uh, the last vote for deacon was back in 1996 or 95 or 93 or something like that. And that's when Brother Rich came along, and uh, but God just blessed us with deacons. Um, but that being said, and these are this is Brother Troy's words and not mine. They're getting long in the tooth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to think. I, I don't want you to think that that uh, I'm trying to push our deacons out. I love our deacons. In fact, we're not voting out any deacons. They're they're, they're continuing to remain deacons. Uh, but the the meeting that's coming up and it's been referred to a couple times. Somebody asked me today if it, what's all the secret squirrel stuff going on. Well, it's not secret. Um, but, but Brother Dan didn't feel like it was his place to say what it's about. Um, but uh, we're, what we're praying for is that, and what we're asking for God is wisdom in bringing along another deacon uh, for now, one deacon for now, and another one probably uh, a time after, a short time after that. But um, that, they, that, this, that the new deacon might begin to learn, um, and because there's, there's a lot to do and a lot of responsibility that comes in that, and we're going to talk about that today. Um, but uh, with that... Um, they, he needs the, the next deacon needs some t- time to to come into place, I guess, and and not to push anybody out. There's wisdom in learning from those that have been there, and uh, there's wisdom in the in them in these men, and I appreciate that. Um, they have truly been a blessing to me. And like I said, I'm not trying to push any of them out. We're trying to keep them here as long as absolutely possible. And, and both of their wives are like, no, no, let us go. Marge has her eye on a, on a condo down, down in Georgia or something. I don't know. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just teasing. Uh, but uh, Tennessee. <laughs> ah, now the honesty comes out. Uh, but, uh, but, but so it, it is time to, to begin to, to look at that. So that's what this is about. So this, after, this, this afternoon's uh, lesson slash message, because I can't ever get, go without preaching at least some, some part of it. Um, uh, that's why we're here in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, starting verse 1, it says, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily administration. Now, the word deacon isn't used here. Uh, and, but what we do see is the need of somebody, and that's where the, the that's where the position of deacon has, uh, came from. It's not a it's not a position of, uh, that was made for authority. It's not a position uh, of of uh, one who has authority over others. It's really a position of ministering. Uh, I looked up the word deacon, uh, not not the English word, but the the word used here and in several other places. Now I got to find my notes where I put it. And throughout Scripture, the word deacon is mentioned uh, several different times. Uh, it's translated minister 
15 times, minister or ministers. It's translated servant or servants seven times. It's only translated as, as the name deacon three times, and that's found in Titus and in 1 Timothy. We're going to be in 1 Timothy today. Uh, the position of deacon is one of a servant. And what we see here in Acts chapter 6 is the very first need of a deacon or, 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 or that servant. And, and the, the apostles have been ministering to the people. Uh, uh, as we, if, if we would go back and look at Acts chapter, Acts chapter 3 and 4, uh, as, as uh, people were selling their belongings, bringing those, bringing those funds to the church to be, to be given out to help others, it says that they, all, they had all things in common. And what a blessing it is to, 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 to see that love in, some, in a Christian's heart that they would be willing to help another out of their own pocketbook. We're all willing to help somebody out of the church's pocketbook. And we're all willing to help somebody out of a group fund. But what a blessing it was to see somebody say, you know what? I have this property. I have. This. I don't need this. I'm going to sell this. And Barnabas is recorded as the first one. And he was known as a man who was a helper. He would come along and help. help. And he would say, I'm going to sell this. And then I'm, instead of him doling out the funds, he said, there's a whole bunch of people that need help. Remember, the church went from 120 to 3,000 in just a day. Uh, it is a large group of people, and over a period of time, they multiplied and multiplied. So there were a large group of people. So you get to Acts chapter 6, and we see what the need was here. Uh, it says that there were a bunch of Grecian women, uh, widows, uh, who were being neglected in the daily administration. Now, I don't believe that the, the, the apostles were looking at them and saying, they're Grecians, we're not going to minister to them. I just believe there were so many people that they were ministering to they got forgotten. They got left out. Uh, and so, and, and they, they make that very clear. Uh, he says, uh, he says there in verse, uh, verse three, the uh, verse two. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, "It's not reason that we, we should leave the word of God and serve tables." Now listen, not that the apostles thought they were above that, but there is a great need for the apostles and for the, the pastors uh, to, to, to be studying in the word and in prayer. And those are the two things that are, are mentioned here in, in, Acts, in Acts chapter 6. Uh, here, the, here and then later on, it says that, the, that they should not leave, leave off, but they should devote their time to ministering the word, studying and teaching the word, ministering that to people, and then also to pray. It, 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 uh, it's been joked many times that the pastor's job is only two days a week or one day a week. Uh, my wife says she wishes that was so. <laughs> but it's not. A pastor's job is to minister to the, to, to the spiritual needs of the congregation. And that's what it means by ministering the word. I've got no wisdom of my own. Uh, I, 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 you know where I, I find my wisdom? The same way you find your wisdom, through prayer and the study of the word. And for me to be able to minister to this family, over, I don't know, pointing at anybody in particular, uh, uh, this family over here, where there's nobody sitting, who's having marital problems, or this person over here who's having, who's having a spiritual struggle with the need of victory, or this person over here who, or who needs some counsel, or the, I need to be able to study the word of God that I might be able to minister to those people. If I don't spend time in the word, it's not just in the, the preaching of the messages, I need to study for that too. Uh, but I just need to study the word so that I understand the word of God and the wisdom of God so that then I can be a blessing and a help to those that need that spiritual help. Uh, and I also need time to pray. In fact, I believe that's almost the more necessary thing uh, because without prayer, I don't have the power of the Spirit of God to preach and I don't have the power of the Spirit of God to minister. Uh, prayer and the Word of God go together. Uh, so, but that's the job of the, 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 uh, the time, the apostles, but also uh, for, the, uh, for the ministers or the, for the elders of the church or, or the pastor. But in the, in, in the church, there are, two, there are two positions that are mentioned. And in 1 Timothy we, chapter 3, we find both those, those positions. One is for the elder or the pastor. The other is for the deacon. The deacon we find here in chapter 6, and, and chapter 6 of the book of Acts, the very first one, and they were there to fulfill a need. They were there to, to, to serve. They were there uh, to, to, to minister to the physical needs of those widows that were, that were being neglected, but not just those widows, but to the physical needs of others. Uh, uh, there are physical needs of the church that the deacons take care of, um, and uh, there are, they, they deal with financial things. They deal with, they deal with uh, many different things here at the church, um, and they deal with some of you because some of you have have needs at times and you reach out to them hopefully that's it's you know if you have a problem don't just hide it if you have a need don't hide it come and tell somebody because otherwise how can we help one another 
So it's important that you do that. And listen, if we don't do that, if we let those things build up, and what would have happened if the Greek, if they'd never come to the apostles and said, hey, our widows are be, aren't being ministered to? I can tell you what would have happened. There would have been a second Jerusalem Baptist church. I'm not, I am not kidding. They would have, they, they, that, that, that small mistake, that oversight, that, 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 listen, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect, and our deacons aren't perfect. And their next deacon won't be perfect. What I'm telling you is that if there's a problem, bring it to our attention so that, so that it can then be dealt with, because what will happen is there'll be a split. Because somebody's, somebody's will be offended, and that offense becomes a, a root of bitterness, which will divide. And then you'll have, uh, it'll divide the, the church apart. And you'll have this group say this to this group. And we've seen it happen all across the, the, the country, and churches all across the country. And we've seen that same problem here. All right? So it's very important that we, that we bring, allow that to come out, right? So that it can then be dealt with. Otherwise, it causes a problem. Thank, thankfully, here in Jerusalem, uh, at the beginning of the church, uh, God gave them the wisdom to do this. Now, I, know, I want you to notice here in verse 3 uh, what, what the, their requirements were for, uh, for the deacons, for these first deacons. It says, Wherefore, brethren, in verse 3, Look ye out among you seven men of honest report. Now there was a number, right? They, they had a number uh, here, a specific number. They said, we don't need a hundred deacons, because if they needed a hundred deacons, they would have appointed a hundred deacons. We, uh, it does, we don't have to have a church full of deacons. We have to have a church full of people with a servant's heart to serve where God, is a, God puts them. But there is a point, there is a, a number there. This is seven men of honest report and full of the Holy Ghost. Now they, they didn't have a whole list, and, for, and Paul tells, teaches First Timothy, or teaches Timothy and us in First Timothy chapter three. There's a list of things, and we're going to look at that here in a few in a, in a few minutes. Uh, there's a list of things that that we that we need to look at when we're looking at deacons. But this is the beginning of the church. They haven't had a whole lot of time. But what they're, what they're saying is, look out, honest men. A men of good report, or have a good character, men that you, that you know, that men that you can trust. And more importantly, and I think this is the most important part of it, filled with the Holy Ghost. If, because if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, it means you're not, you're, you're not letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide you. And, and so they chose out seven men, and those seven men became the, the deacons. The one, one we know of and we, we talk about often is Stephen. And, and listen, uh, we think, well, the deacons are just to serve, and they are, but they also have to have a knowledge of the Word of God because Stephen preached one of the greatest messages ever preached in the, in, in the Bible, and it got him killed. So, so there, 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 is a require, there is a cost at, at times uh, to being a deacon. Now turn with, turn with me, if you would, over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Starting in verse 8, we, where, uh, Paul begins to tell Tim, Timothy of the, the requirements of a deacon. Now I say this, if they're not, these are not the requirements of the things that are, they are expected to do. This, these are the requirements of their character that before they can become a deacon, this is what's expected of the, pers- the people that are, are, are placed in the, the position of deacon. It says this in verse 8. We'll, th- we'll read from verse 8 down to uh, verse, verse uh, 13. It says in verse 8, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Let them Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, slober, slober, sober, they can't slobber, uh, sober, faithful in all things. <laughs> Sorry. Faithful. <laughs> faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and a great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus Christ. Here the, the, the teaching here is, now Paul's teaching Timothy in the first part of this chapter uh, what the, the requirements of, of a bishop or a pastor is, an elder. Uh, and here in verse 8 says, likewise. Uh, one thing you'll notice if you go back and forth they're very similar. 
The, the, the qualifications for a deacon and a pastor are almost alike. Um, and here's the thing. The qualifications for a pastor and a deacon aren't any higher than the qualifications for every Christian. Sometimes we put our pastors and our deacons above everybody else and say they are special. And, 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 and listen, I can tell you for one, I'm not special. And I'm sure Rich, or need, or Marge moved. Of course she's going to say that Rich isn't special. She's not even sitting beside her husband now. Brother, we have a, need to have a talk. <laughs> oh, goodness. The qualifications to be a deacon or to be a pastor aren't any higher than, than what God would require of all of us. It isn't just for a, 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 a deacon or a pastor to be sober. To be, it isn't just for a, a, a deacon or a pastor to, to, to be grave. It's not just for to be honest. It's, we're going to go through these things one at a time so we can really grasp what, they, what they're talking about. But it's not just for the pastor. That God's command to all of us is be holy for I am holy. We, we cannot get away from that. But just like in Acts chapter 6 where he said, choose you out seven men that are full of the Holy Ghost. That tells me something. That while there were seven that were full of the Holy Ghost, there were some that weren't. Now, every child of God has the Holy Ghost within us. Amen? The Bible teaches us that if the Holy Spirit is not inside of you, then you are not one of his. Uh, he indwells every single Christian, but he does not control every single Christian. And that's what the filling of the Holy Spirit is talking about. And, and so uh, it's, it's, it's saying that while this is a requirement or, uh, for, all past, or for all Christians, this is what you're to strive for. Not everybody is going to meet these qualifications. So we're to look for men that meet these qualifications. Verse 8 says, likewise must the deacon be grave. Now, the word deacon means this. It means servant. Waiter of tables. It, it comes from the, 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 the Greek word uh, deaconess. Uh, and, and it's literally the translation of the word is, is deacon. And again, it's, it's used to mean minister. It's used to mean servant. It's, it's meant for somebody to serve and help uh, others. It's one who, who, who serves underneath of somebody. Uh, uh, to, uh, listen, the, the one who the deacon is to serve under is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, chapter, eight, or chapter 3, verse 8 says this, Likewise, must the deacons be grave. What does it mean to be grave? No, it's not, it's not cemetery humor. It comes from the word semnos. The Greek word semnos means honorable, honest, worthy of respect. It's talking about their character. There are some people that have a, a good character that you, 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 you see that person and you know that they're trustworthy. You know that you can, that they, have a, they have that uh, as, a, as a reputation. The, listen, that's supposed to be for all of us, by the way. When we're talking about your reputation and we're talking about your character, you should be honorable. One who, one who can be trusted. Don't be the Christian who goes, to, who goes to work and nobody can trust you because of the things that you say or because of the things that you, you do. And, you're, and you're, they can't trust that, you're, that you'll do the right thing. They, you're to be honorable, worthy of respect. But a deacon is to be worthy of that respect. The next, the next part of the verse says that they're not to be double-tongued. It's the Greek word diligos. It means that they don't have double speech. They don't say one thing to Brother Donnie and then something else to Brother Earl. Right? If they're, they're, they're yay, yay, and they're nays to be nay. This doesn't that what the book of James teaches us. Not just for the deacons, but for every child of God that, that our speech is to, be, is to be true and honest. Uh, we're not to make a vow that we're not going to keep. We're, we're to keep our word. We're to, we're to have that for, for a, a, our reputation. And that's what he's saying. He goes, a, a deacon needs to be somebody who you can trust. Why? Because if, and this is a problem, and it's not a problem in our church. I praise God for it. Sometimes in, in, in some churches, there can be, uh, it can be political games. What do we all know about politicians? They're all liars. Can you trust any of the politicians? I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat or Green Party or, or that weird guy who wears a moose hat every, every time he runs. and uh, or The guy from the New England, I don't know who, where, who he is, uh, who runs every... I don't care who they are, they'll lie. Why? Because it's human nature. And they're trying to win your votes. So I'll tell Donnie what I want Donnie, want, what he wants me to say. 
And he'll, he'll, he'll be behind me. And then I'll go tell somebody else what I think what they want. Why? That's playing politics. That's double speak. As he used to say in the old westerns, you speak with fork and tongue. It's, you can't trust what they say. But I, I'm sorry, as a, as a man of God or a woman of God, your words mean something, or they should. It, it can't have the, the double speak, and it, it, we can't have the we can't have the uh, the, the, the untrustworthiness of, of, of our of our language. We need to say what we mean and mean what we say, and it needs to align with the Word of God. So the qualification for a de- second qualification for the deacon is the first one is that they're honorable and worthy of respect. The second is that they that they're honest, not double tongue. Double tongue does is refer to here. Continuing in verse 8, it says, it says, not double-tongued and not given to much wine. Not given to much wine. The, 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 the word, it's, the way it's translated, is there are three words here. Prosecco, polus, and oinos. It means not addicted, not given over to much alcohol, wine. Scripture's Scripture is repute with the warnings of getting drunk. Go read the book of Proverbs chapter, read Proverbs chapter 23. Actually, let's look at it real quick. There's a danger and in, in an inclination. There's a danger to being given to. And we're going to talk about that word given to here in a minute. But Proverbs chapter 23, verse 29 says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness? Say, what is that talking about? Have you ever been drunk before? <laughs> now, there, there are some people, alcohol affects everybody different. And I... I, and I'm not going to glorify alcohol in, in this at all. I want you to understand that. But there was a period of time when I when I used to partake, and I can I can guarantee you, uh, the people that drink, especially those that drink often, have woe. There there is a, a, a there is a heaviness, uh, a depressive effect of that of that on every on people's moods. Yes, some people get excited and happy for a little while, but I can tell you at the end of it, there's a, there's a problem at the end of that drink. So uh, who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions, fighting? I don't know how many drunk people I had fight me in the back of an ambulance. It used to drive me crazy. I used to hate going to the, to the college. Every Friday night at, at, at the, the college, up at Colby College, every single Friday night, I hated working in Waterville because I ended up spending half the night dragging drunk kids out of, and they're all threatening me with their, with their my dad's a lawyer, and, and I, you, you can't touch me, and you can't do this, and Contention. It's a fighting spirit. Who hath babblings? Well, I've heard a lot of babblings in my time, listening to a drunk person ramble on. Who hath wounds without a cause? How many times has a drunk person seen somebody fall down and, and not able to stand? They bump into this, or they bump into that, they wake up like, I don't know where this came from. I don't know how I, don't know how I got this. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, this is a warning against alcohol. The, the, the redness of the eyes. They that tarry long at the wine. They that go and seek to seek mixed wine. What's it talking about? Those that spend a lot of time drinking. Those that are addicted to. Those that, are, are, that struggle with that. And you say addiction. The, 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 we use that word. Uh, to, to, but, and, and there is an addiction to it. Don't, don't take me wrong. Uh, the, there are people that just rely upon the stuff. And you get to the point where you have to have it. Literally, uh, uh, if, if, if there's somebody who, is, who, who tries to, uh, tr- I'm trying to think of the medical word where they stop drinking all of a sudden, I've lost it for some reason. But if, you stop, if you're somebody who's truly addicted to alcohol and you stop drinking, you can actually die from it. It can cause your heart to go into arrhythmias and stop. You get to the point where you physically need it to survive. It is dangerous stuff. 
It says, look, verse 31, and here, here comes the warning. It says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth the color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, and the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Man, it looks pretty. It sounds like a good time. And listen, that's how they advertise it, too. You see them, they're at the beach, they're at the, they're at the pool, everybody's, uh, everybody's throwing back a, 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 a cold one, or whatever you want to call it, uh, alcohol. And, but they don't show you the, the pictures of the, 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 the bruised women and the, the hurt children and the broken family and the, the, the guy who's so drunk that he's, he's wet himself and, and vomited on his bed. They don't show you those things, but, but that's the bite of the serpent. That's the bite of the adder. That's what it comes down to. We need to be very careful to understand the Bible teaches us against drunkenness. The Bible also says for Timothy, to take, Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for your stomach. There were medicinal purposes for it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, there, were, there were some, there, there were warning in, in that chapter uh, of, of some who, when they were coming to partake of the Lord's Supper, were getting drunk. I'm sorry, but how can you get drunk if they're not drinking wine at the Lord's Supper? Well, we don't do that. We use grape juice. Why? Because, well, we don't want to be drinking alcohol. Uh, uh, the Bible says that we're to, to, we're to, to, to stay away from the... the uh, the, the semblance of all evil. We don't, somebody, we don't want somebody to see us and think, oh, that person's, a, a, right? I, I, we want to stay away from that stuff. We're to be holy as God is holy. So, and we're looking at the qualification of this. The qualification is someone who is not given to, not addicted to, uh, not inclined to, be someone who clings to, to, who adheres to alcohol because it's dangerous. It affects their minds. It affects the way they think. And listen, m- most importantly, think about what alcohol does to somebody. And what the Holy Spirit does to somebody. God, there's a reason God used uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, why God says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Because both of those things affect us. Right? And they affect us. It affects the way we think and the way we talk and the way we act when, we, when we're drunk on alcohol. Uh, so, and the Bible teaches us that we should not be drunk. But what we should be instead is filled with the Holy Spirit. Allowing the Holy Spirit to control our thoughts and our actions and, our, and the things that we do and the things that we say. So the qualification here is one who is not given to, one who is not addicted to, one who is not inclined to, does not cling to alcohol. Be very careful of that. The, 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 next, the next inclination is, inclination, the next qualification is, there's the word I'm looking for, is, found in verse, is also found in verse 8. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Uh, the, word, the word here is, it's a long one. Ahi uh, scrander dace. I can't pronounce it correctly, but it means sordid. It means eager for base gain. The love of money. Well, what's the Bible teach us about the love of money? It's the root of all evil. It's not that money is the root of all evil. Thank goodness, because we need it to live. We need to pay our bills. We all have to, we all have to possess it. 1 Timothy 6.10 is, is the verse that says that, that the love of money is the root of all evil. James chapter 4, verse 13 uh, through chapter 5, verse 6, uh, gives us a warning for those that, that, that heap money into themselves uh, and are, have made big plans on that. Listen, it's not about the money. It's not about being a, uh, what it can get us. Uh, that, but that love of money is dangerous. Because it can become a temptation in the life of somebody who then handles money. One of the, one of the uh, things that they did back in those days was the ministration of, uh, to the daily needs of the widows. Where do you think the things that they ministered with came from? The pockets of the people that were bringing it. If, you're, if somebody's going to have their hand in the finances of the church, we want that person to, to not have a love or a greed for money. Why? Because we don't want them to be tempted to defraud the church, to steal the money. You see what happens in that? Uh, Judas was the one who held the bag. And what does the Bible record of Judas? He was a thief. There were times when he would make a, 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 an argument not to help, not to, not to help others or, or an argument that, that, that uh, something shouldn't be done because of the money it costs and we can do something better with it. Uh, remember the woman who uh, poured the oil out on Jesus' feet? Why are we letting her do that? We, that could be used to the widows. He, and the Bible says he said it because he carried the bag and he was a thief. 
It, it affects the motivations. It affects, uh, it affects the things that you do. Listen, uh, there, there are times when, when uh, money is given out, and I, I praise the Lord that when, when, we're able, when we do that. Well, what, what a blessing it is to be able to, to be a blessing to someone in, in need. But I, I, never want our, 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 uh, I never want there to be a problem when, if, with a deacon, and there never should be in any church where somebody says, well, we can't do that because of this. And really the motivation is, I want control of that money. Even if they don't want it for their own pocket, it should always be about what the Lord leads, leads us to do as a church. So this idea of not being greedy, a filthy lucre, not being controlled by money or our love for it is another qualification for a deacon. Also a qualification for a pastor, by the way, but, but uh, you're all stuck with me now. Look at verse 9 for our next qualification for a deacon. This is an important one. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Let's, let's break this down a little bit so we understand what it's saying. What is the mystery of the faith? Well, for the first word is translated, echo, is translated from the word echo. It means to, to have or to hold, to cling to, to adhere to. So he says that the, the, well, the qualification for a deacon is that he clings to, that he holds to something. And that something is the mystery of the faith. We so say there's no mystery in the faith. Actually, for, 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 for the time, when the time of this was written, uh, there was mystery. Old Testament mystery. Uh, the, the writings in the Old Testament uh, that were given to the Jews were for the learning and, and the revealing in the New Testament. Now, we, we have the Old Testament. We have the book of 1 Timothy, but, uh, but they were just getting it. They didn't have the book of Romans and all these other things. All the, they, so uh, there, was, there were mysteries that were being revealed to the church at the time. Uh, 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 what's the, the mystery of, God, of godliness? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. There were things that were being revealed to them that they didn't know in the Old Testament. That they hadn't been taught before. Yes, they were pictured in the Old Testament, but, but weren't revealed to the New Testament. So, so he says the qualification of a deacon is one who holds, who adheres to, who clings to those mysteries. That mystery of the faith. Who God is. The fact that he is the creator of all things and, and the, the one who gives us salvation. And, and who Christ is. And that, through, that salvation is only through him. Cling to those things. If our deacons aren't going to hold to the, to the, to the gospel, and listen, that is not the person you want to have in that position. Because it is a position which at times requires teaching. The Bible teaches that the pastor is to teach, to teach uh, faithful men so that they can then teach others also. The idea is this multiplication that, that it's not just always a pastor. I appreciate that, that, we, that I could have Brother, Brother Rich and Brother, Brother Troy get up here and preach messages. And, 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 and they'll, listen, they, they teach the same truths because they, they, they teach, preach and teach from the same book that I do. And, and, but they can do it in different ways because their style is different. Brother, 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 brother Troy is a very... Uh, mechanical, scientific, he taught a, uh, he preached one time this mathematic, I don't know, I still haven't figured it all out, brother. But in the end, it worked. And it was like, wow, that was really good. I don't know how you did that. Because I, I can't do that. And Brother, brother Rich is expository. He goes verse by verse and just, and open, and listen, praise God that we have men of God who can, teach the, who can teach the word of God. They have to hold fast to the mystery of the word of God. If they won't, they shouldn't be in the position of, of deacon. The last thing we see here in verse 9, sorry, verse, yes, it says that they, they do it in a pure conscience. Pure means without corruption. The, the conscience is talking about the, the, the consciousness of their mind. Paul says, I am free from the blood of all men. Why? Because he taught the gospel of Jesus Christ to everybody, day and night, knocking on doors. There's something that, that, that our deacons need to have a heart for, is that, to, not just to hold to the, the gospel, but to teach the gospel. 
And I'm not saying that they have to preach it from the pulpits or the rooftops, but they have to have a desire. And listen, it's for the pastor. The Bible says the pastor is to be apt to teach, but they should have a desire not just to hold to, uh, but their conscience needs to be free, the fact that they have the gospel and the world does not. And the only way we can have a pure conscience and free uh, from any kind of conviction or guilt is if we're preaching and teaching the gospel ourselves. Verse 10 says this, and let these also first be proved. Now back in the book of Acts, they didn't have a chance to prove any of them because the church was brand new. It was only chapter 6 of the book of Acts. But here in Timothy, uh, here in 1 Timothy, uh, he's saying, listen, you need to prove these men before you give them a position. Uh, as, and I say this, as a servant. It's not a position of high authority, a position uh, that's to be lifted up. The Bible says we're to humble ourselves and God will lift us up. And we'll see in a moment that it is, and in their service, God will exalt them uh, uh, in, in time. Uh, but but uh, in doing this, uh, they first must be proved. So how do we do that? We watch them. Paul, Paul says we're not, to, we're not to lay hands quickly on any man. Right? We, we watch them. We make sure that they're faithful, they're true. We don't have somebody walk through and join the church and then the next week, okay, we want you to be deacon. As, as much as, it easy, as easy as that would be to fill a position that way, right? Hey, you, can you be a Sunday school teacher? We need to be proved first. We need to know what they believe and that, that they agree with us. And, right? there, there needs to be a time of proving. Now, I'm not saying it has to be six months or, uh, or, or ten years or, or, or in some cases 50 years. That They need to be proved until they meet the qualifications. And then once they, they come to that point, they meet those qualifications, it tells us this in verse, verse uh, 10. Then let them use the office of a deacon or servant being found blameless. So there needs to be a period of time where, we, where they're observed and watched. And, and listen, the, brother, brother Troy and Brother Rich were deacons before I was ever here. So I didn't have a chance to observe them before, but I have had a chance to observe them since. And I praise God and thank God for the deacons that we have. But that being said, if we're looking, for, looking to replace, not, not looking to add to the deacons, again, I'm not trying to replace them or kick them out, they're like rats. <laughs> But in looking to a place, so what does that mean? That, that we don't just pick people. And I, I want you to understand this. I, I've prayed for a while. They've been praying for a really long time. <laughs> I've prayed for a while about where God might lead and who God might bring in this position, into this position. I ask you to pray with me. I'm not going to give you a name till next till the 16th, which is next Sunday. But God has laid somebody on my heart. I want you to pray that God would direct and God would, would bless and that God's will would be done in all this. Okay? Uh, but So the, I want you to understand, though, it's, it's somebody that I've seen grow. It's somebody that I've seen God use. Somebody that I've seen be faithful, even in hard times. Somebody that, I've, that I believe is respectable and honorable, that I, that I honestly believe fulfill these qualifications. If I didn't believe they, they, they did, I wouldn't be bringing them before you next week. Continuing on, verse 11 says this, even so must their wives be grave. So it's not just for the, the, the husband, but their, their wife must be grave. And what, again, going back to the grave, what does that mean? It means, it means that, she's of, that she is... Uh, honorable and honest and of, uh, of a good report. Why? Because a husband, uh, listen, behind every good man, behind every spiritual man, is a good woman. I praise God for my wife who encourages me. Listen, there have been times when, uh, when I came and, and, and she had greater faith than me. I'm like, how did you, you, you've not been saved nearly as long. How can that happen? Because God's given me a good wife. And she's grown. But so, so the wife was also to be grave and to be honorable and to be one that's worthy of respect. Continuing on, it says that she must not, she must not be slanderous. I mean, she can't be slanderous. She can't be making false accusations and, and gossiping all the time. Man, that's, that is a problem for everybody. 
And again, when I say this, uh, this ladies, this, is, this should apply to all of you as well. And all of the guys. Guys gossip just as much as girls. What I'm saying is it's for all Christians. And gossip, will, gossip will not only destroy a friendship, gossip will destroy a church. We need to be very careful of that, but it's, uh, the qualification for the, the wife of a deacon is that she, that she be not slanderous, grave, third is sober. What does it mean? The word sober doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. It doesn't mean that she's just not a, a drunk, uh, but that she's serious. And the word actually used is, is also means circumspect. circumspect. I mean, she's got her head on a swivel. She, she's not one to, to be frivolous and, and get caught up in the moment. Have you ever been around with a bunch of kids in, in a dangerous situation? Have you ever taken your kids out someplace that might be dangerous? Have you ever done that? We, we took our kids on a boat. And this is what my wife told me uh, yesterday. We took her on, on the kids on a boat just a couple days ago. And this is what my wife told me. She goes, I've been so stressed the entire time we've been out here. Because I'm just waiting for somebody to fall overboard. My kids were having a blast. I, I, Hannah at one point was hanging over like this. Every time we saw one, we were like, hey, don't do that. I'm grateful that my wife was sober, that she was always looking out. Why? Because I wasn't always looking in the same direction she was. And I don't know how many times, because I was driving the boat, and I was trying to make sure we didn't hit any rocks and, and do those types of things. I'm so grateful that my wife was there to say, hey, listen, it's, don't, don't do that, don't do that. And, uh, the the, the buzzkill of the group is what my wife was. So somebody has to be. And it's, a, it's another wife that said it. <laughs> you know what it is? Because the pastor or a deacon needs to have a wife who has his back, whose head's always on a swivel, saying, hey, honey, this could be dangerous. Hey, honey, did you see that this happened over here or this family's struggling or this person? We need that because we, we got eyes, but we don't have eyes that look everywhere. So I'm grateful for the, for the women that God has placed uh, with the men, the, with our deacons. Because they are a blessing to our church. So that's, a, again, another qualification is for the wife to be sober, not slanderous, and grave, and then faithful in all things. The word faithful means trustworthy. Faithful in all things, that we can trust them in, in every account. Listen, I, I am grateful uh, that, that I have a wife that I can trust, and, and that our deacons have wives that they can trust uh, in, in not just a little thing, not just here and there, but in all things. And listen, you, you ought to be thankful for it too, because it affects our whole church. If, if our deacons' wives aren't faithful, if, our, if, if my wife isn't faithful, uh, listen, that, that, that causes problems in the church, but will eventually cause division in the church contentions and strifes and, and those types of things. The deacon's wife is to be faithful in all things. Verse 12 says, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. That I am grateful that our, our deacons only have one wife. <laughs> Do not have two wives. <laughs> Rich is getting bruises on his arm over here. <laughs> that, was, that was from her, wasn't it? <laughs> I trust that she's keeping you in line. <laughs> oh, goodness. The deacons need to be husbands of one wife. Now, there, 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 are different, there are different ways people translate that. Some say, well, a deacon cannot be divorced. Others will say, well, that's saying you can't have more than one wife. Well, we can't have more than one wife. Um, anyways, I take the, the most cautious route. I cannot guarantee you 100% that this means that, that, that a deacon cannot be somebody who's been divorced. However, I also know that one day I want to stand before God and answer for that. And so I want our deacons to be men who have not been divorced. Now, that being said, men and women who have been divorced, I'm not saying they cannot be used of God. They can serve. And, man, I, I, I tell you, some, some of, I, I praise God for people that are just willing to serve in whatever capacity that they can. Uh, what a blessing it is to have that kind of heart. But, uh, but, our, but uh, the positions of, of, of deacon in our church and pastor of our church 
I believe, at very best, we should be held to the highest regard. Now, we know what the Bible says about divorce, that God's against it. God hates divorce. If you're divorced, don't get mad at me. I'm only repeating what Jesus said. But we also know in Scripture that he allowed for divorce. And there's forgiveness. We talked last Sunday about second chances and third chances. There is forgiveness. There is growth. There is moving forward. But again, we're talking about the qualifications specifically of a deacon. The deacon be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house well. Why is that important? Because it is a, while it's not a position of authority, it shows their heart. And I say that, our deacons make some decisions, right? Our, our, our deacons, in fact, in fact, sometimes they do things that I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that they're trying to go behind my back. Uh, there was something that, that had to be purchased, and I get I get a quarterly report every month, and I happened to be looking. It was on my desk today. I was looking through it, and I said, I said, there's a, a, a credit card purchase for three hundred and eighteen dollars, or maybe it was multiple purchases. I don't know, but I haven't had a credit card in months. Where did that come from? <laughs> now I'm, it was for stamps and for other things that were necessary. Don't don't miss them. They're not. Taking any money, or making making uh, purchases without that aren't necessary. It just I was like I they did that, and I'm like ah, oh, I'm glad, glad that we have men that we can trust. I'm I'm glad that we have men that I know that won't take advantage of that. But if they can't rule their own finances, and if they can't be the spiritual heads of their houses that they're supposed to be, if they can't not be the father to the children that they're supposed to be. Again, these are all things that we're all supposed to be. Every man of God and every woman of God is to, is to be able to do these things. But they are held to the standard because of the position that they hold. Rule their own houses well. Lastly, we're going to look at verse 13, and this isn't a qualification, but this is talking about the using of the office of deacon. It's for they that have used the office of deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree, a good degree, and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. There is a blessing to being a deacon. I say that because there is a blessing in being a servant, and that's what the position is. There is a blessing in being able to help somebody and 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 building that relationship. There is a blessing in being able to come alongside and and being a spiritual encouragement to somebody. There is a blessing uh, in and being able to, to to financially and physically help help others. Uh, you're purchasing with your works, uh, uh, with, with those works. There there is a spiritual blessing that others won't have. Why? Because you've served in ways that others haven't. You've given others. It, it, it costs you time. It costs you. Uh, uh, yes, it has cost us a lot of time. They're not complaining, by the way. Uh, uh, it costs you time. It costs you energy. And I praise God that we've had men who are willing to do that. I praise God that we have others that are still willing to do that. There's a benefit. Can I ask you to pray for our deacons? They, they do need your prayer, and they do need your help. Can I ask you to pray with me for this vote that's going to be coming up on this next meeting and the vote coming up? Because I'll be honest, I want God's will to be done, um, not my will. Our bylaws, and this is our bylaws, we, I've looked at them um, because I want to be sure we did everything correctly. Um, and there's not a whole lot in there about uh, about uh, replacing deacons or adding deacons. Um, as it seems to be at the pastor's discretion, and then and then upon a church vote. Uh, so it seems like the, to be appointed. Now, I know scripturally, um, it says that uh, the apostles told them to seek out seven men. That's why one of the reasons why I believe that we vote um, vote on the on this position of deacon, um, and we're to prove them. And I believe that, I believe that's why I believe that's why it was left for the pastor to to prove them and to 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 be able to observe them and be sure. But pray for this, if you would, um, that when the time comes that we that we do what God would have us to do.
We're not going to cast lots like they did uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, to replace Judas. We're going to pray and ask God to give us the direction uh, that he can, or that he will. Uh, but that is the, the, that is the qualifications of a deacon, and the need of a deacon is that we do have needs in our church. Um, that w- each deacon, I believe, is is set over a, a certain number of people. They divide up uh, all of your names, and uh, they're there to pray for you, they're to reach out to you if they can, and as, they, as, as the Lord leads. But uh, be praying for them, be praying with me about the about the hiring, a new, or not hiring, but appointing a new, new deacon, and then God's will be done in all this. And the church will continue to be blessed. Because you see what happened right after that? Uh, God continued to grow the church. I praise, I, praise the Lord. I praise the Lord we need another deacon, to be honest with you. It's a good thing. I praise the Lord that we needed more seats. Now we're not able to use all the seats at the same time, but think what it would be like if we didn't have the seats to use. I, I praise the Lord that we... That the, that we're able not only to get the tent, but there's a need for the tent on, on, for the revival. The tent seats 100 people. Now, we used to be able to fit 100 people in here. We're not allowed to do that right now. Um, uh, this morning we had, counting all of our volunteers, which don't count, thankfully, uh, we had 57. Um, and some that weren't here. So praise God for that. Um, but uh, God is working. I rejoice in the work that God is doing. And pray that God's will be done. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father God, I thank you. God, I praise, praise you for all that you've done, Lord. I praise you for, for the men that you've uh, placed in our church. And, and just the, the, the blessing that, that they have been. Uh, God, I pray that you would lead us and guide us as we, as, we come, uh, to this, as we come up to this point, Lord. As we uh, are looking to add, add a deacon to our, 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 our group, Lord, our board. I, I pray, Lord, that you just give wisdom. Lord, that you would guide and direct. And Lord, it's not a popularity contest. Lord, it's not, it has nothing to do with those things. Lord, we want your will to be done. Lord, I pray that you would lead us to the right person. Lord, I pray that uh, that, 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 that position would be filled uh, to the best of their ability, Lord, as the Holy Spirit leads and guides. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen.